Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Genesis. Uh, as usual, I would like to say thank you very much to Mr. William Gardner for showing up and sharing his amazing information and knowledge and research. And tonight he's going to speak again about his book, The Trouble mm -hmm. with Democracy, and the focus is going to be on Karl Marx. So thank you, William, and the floor is yours. Once again, I, I thank you for having me. Uh, I really enjoy speaking with your people about these topics. <clears throat> so today is a, basically a continuation of the last uh, lecture, which was just a week ago. And uh, it seemed to be, that seemed to be a, proving to be a pretty attractive one. It's posted on my own YouTube site. And I think over, I only posted it yesterday and over a thousand visitors have uh, come to it already. So I guess this is a good sign. <laughs> And anyway, what I want to talk about today is how the theoretical basis of my talk last time in which I outlined the various steps by means of which um, democracy becomes totalitarian. We're now going to talk about the first of two major examples of this in the real world. The first being uh, international Marxism. And then next week, we'll talk about uh, Hitler's uh, Nazism. Uh, both Marx and Hitler referred to their systems, <laughs> if you're not going to laugh, <laughs> because in the West we've been trained to believe that, for example, democracy and totalitarian systems are diametrically opposed. And I tried to show you last week how one becomes the other. So it shouldn't be a surprise if you understand all that, why Marx referred to his system <clears throat> as true democracy quote unquote, true democracy. Uh, so let me now begin with a few prefatory remarks and then we'll get right into uh, the material on Marx himself. This little segment is called More Murder in the Name of Democracy. Ironically, all these totalitarian devices, I mean, the ones I mentioned last time, were justified by the euphoric politics of radical freedom first developed in the name of the general will against the absolutism of monarchy during the hysteria of the French Revolution. Uh, that was their first theoretical basis. But they suffered an immediate historical transformation into what I call the mystical politics of collectivism and the absolutism of the people fused I get the word fuse or fusion, fused into the democratic state. So I now want to show <clears throat> how the two most powerful ideological movements of the modern period, Marxism and Nazism, were in fact embodiments of the same deadly combination of mass democratic theory and secular millenarianism. Now, in some of our other lectures, we talked about millenarianism and especially the modern form, which is secular, um, which has all the um, energy behind it of the religious millenarianism without God. Okay. In other words, it's something which is undertaken by uh, people of a messianic temperament who've lost their faith in God. Uh, and this reduces them to faith in themselves in uh, ordinary uh, secularized society and Athe even atheistic human beings, that they can bring about the perfect kingdom of heaven on earth. So they set the standard for what I call the slaughterhouse of history that was the 20th century, and it certainly was a slaughterhouse. What follows makes no claim to being a complete, complete analysis of these two quite fascinating and different ideological movements. They were many things all at once. But I want to address the most fundamental question, namely, of what, of what profound underlying human need were these movements and expression? Uh, a compelling conclusion, at least my conclusion, is that they arose from the unfortunate combination of a specifically modern romantic theory of democracy. And now romantic in this sense is a specialized term. It has nothing to do with you know, falling in love with somebody or anything like that it has to do with the romantic movement in, in the arts and letters and other theoretical works, um, which 
tended to uh, focus on the uh, image of the lamp as opposed to the mirror. So the real object of human beings, whether intellectuals or artists, was to become as lamps and radiate reality outwards to other people, especially the reality of their own individual selves, which is why in modern art classes, for example, if you go to a modern art class anywhere in the Western world, you're going to hear the, the teacher stress originality. We want you to express yourself. You must be original, all that kind of thing. It, it's hard to believe, actually, how radical that change is compared to what a teacher would have told students only, say, two, three hundred years before, which would have been something like this. <clears throat> here's here's a statue by Michelangelo. And uh, here's a work of art, a beautiful drawing by Leonardo. I want you to try to do this drawing. Try to draw like him. Try to make a sculpture like, like this man. In other words, mirror the excellence that you see around you which is already there. We already have the most excellent sculptures in history. Why are you trying to, why are you trying to do something original? <laughs> Since you're, you're not going to, you're not going to match the excellence of, of the best that's ever been done. So why don't you try to copy it, at least copy the style? However, uh, I'm a bit off track here, but I was basically saying the, uh, what profound underlying human needs were these movements and expression. And, and I said that a compelling conclusion is that they arose from the unfortunate combination of a specifically modern romantic theory of democracy with its focus on the individual self. You see the connection here and not on the, you know, anything else and collective freedom and our ancient tradition of millenary and yearning. The whole brew made poisonous by a, I'm sorry for all these terms, but we've been over them before, made poisonous by a Gnostic, in other words, a world-hating, what the Romans, uh, ancient Latins called the contemptus mundi, the hatred of the world, a world-hating um, uh, uh, by a poisonous Gnostic atheism, scientism, and materialism, and it was made practically possible and dangerous. Here we go by the unprecedented tax wealth of the post-industrial age. So that's the theory I'm putting together, is that these kinds of yearnings and peculiar um, urges to create the kingdom of heaven on earth have really all been around for centuries, many, many centuries. And in Norman uh, Cohn's amazing book, The Pursuit of the Millennium, you'll see all that in the religious context. And once that, once that gets secularized, and you combine it with the enormous tax harvests of modernity, uh, you're looking at trouble uh, because people soon have the means to actually actu actualize their dreams of the perfect civilization. <clears throat> civilization is filled with despots posing as saviors, but modern times are the first in which there has been sufficient means extracted through various forms of tax slavery I mean, good heavens, uh, what, I, what we call Tax Freedom Day here in Canada, you know, I think is around the middle of June, which, which, as I said before, means you're working for the government. Um, okay, end of May, first part of June. I can't remember. It changes by year, but it's around there. So five and a half to six months of your life every year, you're actually working for the government, not for yourself and your family. Well, you know, compared to, say, the turn of the, of the 20th century, when total taxes were around 12% and there was no income tax. You know, you, you can just see the massive difference that this has created, which is why this money has been extracted through various forms of tax slavery or what some economic libertarians call legal plunder uh, to attempt the realization of the salvationist visions. See, so I'm combining here the salvationist hunger, the vision of the perfect world, and the um, tax wealth, <laughs> in which the Western world, at least, uh, has pretty much been drowning. Karl Marx was the first, after the failed French Revolution, to give the old formula a new life. So now we begin on my brief section on Marx called Marx's True Democracy. 
And as I say, when I first read that phrase, I went, uh, it can't be so. I had grown up like everybody else, believing that my father went to Europe and fought against uh, communism and Nazism because they were totalitarian systems. Now we have scholars referring to Marxist theories as true democracy, which is what he called it. And um, again, I cite Sir Herbert Reed. Communism, he said, is an extreme form of democracy, quote, unquote. So Marxism and the communism that grew from it are commonly presented as the foundations of totalitarianism and the very opposite of democracy. But this statement would have outraged Marx, who from the start considered himself the purest of Democrats. In fact, he left the word democracy behind only because he was convinced that in communism, democracy was not only maintained, but raised to a higher significance. He saw his totalitarian program, though he would not have called it that, as a fulfillment, his words, of true democracy, quote unquote. Without going too deeply into the arguments for and against Marx as a totalitarian Democrat, and in the notes to my book, you'll see some of that, I would argue that he was a radical freedom fighter and in most respects, most respects, more anarchical than Rousseau because he fully believed, as Rousseau had only hoped, that the people would educate and emancipate themselves as part of an inevitable historical process. Well, we know the old story about Marx and Hegel and, you know, that Marx, Marx took Hegel off his head and stood him on his feet, meaning he turned the theory into a, material, into a more materialistic philosophy. Um, <clears throat> where are we? Okay. His chief goal was a spontaneous socialist revolution that would trash present society and replace it with one in which each individual had maximum control over his or her own life in dedication to the common good. If not for the last six words of that sentence, he would have sounded like a hippie before his time. But the business about the common good, once he linked it with the idea of total democracy, put a machine gun in the hippie's hands. My purpose in including this segment on Marx is to present him as a theorist of democracy and of collective freedom in the tradition of Rousseau, but with modifications that sprang from his materialist and scientific beliefs. And by the way, I think it was 1898 or so, uh, a very um, distinguished, I believe he was Austrian scholar named Boom Baverk, Eugen Boom Baverk, wrote a very small book, which I have here, uh, called Karl Marx and the Close of the System. By close, he means the end. The end of a system. It was first published, I think, in 1898, and it was a it was a meticulous takedown of Marx's own theory, especially in its economic elements, where he's basically arguing that Marx got it wrong, that uh, the whole fundamental basis of his theory was wrong from the start. Here's what he said: What I will say, however, is that no one with so powerful a mind as Marx has ever exhibited a logic so continuously and so palpably wrong as he exhibits in the systematic proof of his own fundamental doctrine. So that was before the turn of the 20th century, but I can't say it, it went anywhere because very few people read it, only a few scholars, and most of them were leftists who were very fond of the whole Marxist idea anyway. So Bumbaberg's critique, which is still very solid, it's only about a 100-page book, 8,900 pages. <laughs> You'll see how he uh, tore the thing to the whole theory to pieces. You know, Marx's whole theory of surplus value is at the heart of his book, Das Kapital. But what he failed to understand, and I understand it when I hire people like my electrician or my plumber, and I, I go, oh, my God, that's... They want 75 bucks an hour or whatever it is they're asking me. And you realize right away that these people aren't stupid. Uh, uh, they're not slaves to labor. 
they're they're building their own profits into their charge. In other words, uh, Marx's sur- theory of surplus value, how the owners of enterprises were ripping off the workers, t- basically taking the surplus value of what the workers had created, was 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 basically quite wrong because most people, like I, ones who come to my house and, uh, to help me fix something, uh, they're building in their profits already into their wage uh, or charge. Anyway, back to um, back to the uh, the actual text. My purpose in including this segment on Marx is to present him as a theorist of democracy and collective freedom in the tradition of Rousseau, but with modifications that sprang from his materialist and scientific beliefs, which weren't very scientific, I'm just trying to say. The communism that eventually emerged from his theories was a fusion of the Gnostic and millenarian forces that were already shaping the political and moral battleground of the 20th century, but in a mutation that followed straight from his thoughts. Indeed, Marx fancied that he was formulating, quote, a genuinely universal concept of democracy, unquote. That would, that would overcome the ugly discrepancy between the theory and practice of democratic individualism in its liberal form, a form on which he was certain, he called it the universal sun, had set, and in which now only private lamps grow. I mean, the private lamps of capitalists. He saw modern liberal democracies as half-hearted systems protecting the rich by exploiting the working classes. So he dreamed of restoring the universal sun through a democracy of the whole community. His humanism was to mean the final resolution of all dualisms, that is, of all antagonism between man and man, man and nature, existence and essence, and the one and the many. For him, pure social democracy or communism would mean the end of moral and economic slavery and the beginning of the final spiritual unity of the human species. Marx shared Rousseau's ideas that society had become corrupted and oppressive of man's true nature, that private property is immoral because it creates a divisive social, uh, creates divisive social classes and oppresses the poor, that democracy is a farce unless it means the free expression by all of the common good, that voluntary civil society is only an expression of selfish interests that must be dissolved to create a higher unity. <clears throat> That traditional Christianity, bracket, and for Marx, all religion in general, close the bracket, has made such political and social unity impossible by dividing the citizens' loyalty between Caesar and Christ. And finally, that egalitarian democracy alone, as the voice of a people with universal suffrage, would mean full human emancipation and result in the highest social form. Marx extended and complicated these ideas by his belief, again gained from Hegel, that reality is not about things, but about a natural and inevitable historical process that unfolds by its own laws towards an ever higher state of social perfection. He came to believe that democracy was only a necessary stage along the way and that in the end, the perfect society would transcend even democracy and be classless, propertyless, free marketless, and stateless, a true Garden of Eden. Is it not extraordinary to realize that the process at work here was not the one that Marx imagined, but rather the old anti-authoritarian vision, uh, vision of perfection of the Anabaptists and the adepts of the free spirit of the Middle Ages and so many other of the Middle Ages and of later periods of religious and democratic upheaval. To the radical Marx, our modern liberal democracies and all their political and economic institutions 
are just a legitimization of class privilege based on a right to private property that enshrines the dominance of capital interests and converts all natural human relations into inauthentic commercial ones. To him, liberal parliamentary governments were really executive committees of the ruling property class. He wanted to use the theory of mass democracy and of collective freedom to overcome liberal democracy and the representative system it requires. Like the ancient Athenians and like Rousseau, he felt that democratic representation was an alienation of the true will of the people and thus a betrayal of democracy. And going back again, that's exactly what, uh, what Rousseau felt, that representative democracy was a betrayal of true democracy because it wasn't the will of the people. <laughs> it was the will of the people as transformed by their representatives. And this gets quite interesting in our own uh, Western tradition because we had people like Edmund Burke, as I say, who wrote his wonderful little letter to the electors of Bristol when they complained that he wasn't taking their wishes to Parliament. <laughs> and the essence of his letter was that I represent all the people of England, not just the people who sent me to Parliament. And you must rely on my, on my judgment uh, to make good decisions on, on the behalf of all of our people. Uh, see, that was a direct um, contrary notion to the notion of direct democracy that the fellow complaining to him uh, had voiced. You know, he thought that he could give instructions to his representative and therefore his will would be represented in parliament. But Burke said, no, no, uh, it's, not, it's not the way it works. You know, when you send me to parliament, you're expecting me to make um, rational decisions based on the situation, uh, not just a messenger boy. If you want a messenger boy, you might as well pick someone out of the phone book and send them to parliament uh, rather than me. Anyway, um, <laughs> like the ancient Athenians and Rousseau, Marx felt that democratic representation was an alienation of the true will of the people and thus a betrayal of democracy. But he was not interested in any defense of the egoistic rights of men as individuals. He saw liberalism as a pernicious system enabling individual men to assert their selfish interest, which they call freedom, against the common good. This he called a deformation of freedom. He was, at bottom, an egalitarian Democrat who wanted the utmost social cooperation between citizens bracket, who must learn to desire the good, <clears throat> not just for themselves, but for each other, close the bracket. And so he plumped for positive rights, um, writing that, quote, this is his writing, only in community is personal freedom possible, unquote. That's a new kind of thinking for many of us in the individualistic West. Uh, individualistic political systems that we now have. Only in community is personal freedom possible. He wanted changes in society so radical as to provide every single human being with the ability and the freedom to enjoy the utmost self-fulfillment, but of a selfless kind. This follows if you believe that freedom means your naturally charitable nature will finally be allowed to spring forth. Indeed, for Marx, the best equality was no mere equality before the law, which to him presupposes, it, indeed, it perpetuates human differences and real inequalities. What he wanted, rather, was an equality in which natural charity compensates for weakness and disadvantage such that each according to his ability gives freely to each according to his need. Get that? He gives freely. It's not extracted by force and transferred from the one who gains it to the one who needs it. He's to give freely to each according to his need. In this respect, he went beyond Rousseau, who wanted a mere equality for all. 
What Marx wanted was a compensatory equality. His was a secular Christian version of voluntary communal charity. But the linchpin was universal suffrage. This eventually came to mean rule by the most numerous, which is to say the working class or the proletariat. Unlike his later followers, however, who absorbed, absorbed elitist ideas from the radicals of the French Revolution and concluded that the apathetic workers needed to be led to revolution because they wouldn't get there by themselves, Marx persisted in his belief that once emancipated by universal democratic suffrage, workers would spontaneously self-educate and that the reorganization of all human relationships under their temporary dictatorship, dictatorship of the working class, and, you know, and by this word, by the way, he meant a kind of stewardship, uh, would lead naturally to his cherished classless society. This is obviously a man who never spent any time in a small town hockey arena observing the self-education of the masses. <laughs> well, that's a Canadian comment. We have a lot of hockey here. Probably the equivalent where you are would be soccer or something like that. Or football is, I think you call it football, <laughs> where you can see the so-called self-education of the masses. Uh, at any rate, he was blinded with hope for radical libertarian democracy of a communal sort. And he considered all prior notions of freedom to be deceptions or illusions. In his vaunted new world, the means to and end motives for all commercial relationships would pass away and would be replaced by authentic ends in themselves, humane ones. Power elites would disappear. And the current money economy, in which the free market and its impersonal laws control the well-being of some to the detriment of others, he said, would be eliminated forever. He saw a fully free society in which his word necessary labor was reduced to the minimum to procure the basic needs for all and all other work. The time now spent in pursuit of meaningless commercial objectives and artificial manufactured desires, like producing things that people don't really need, they just happen to want them, would become unnecessary. <laughs> By the way, when you go into my local drugstore, which is also a kind of everything store, and you walk down the aisle looking for some shampoo for your hair, it's bewildering. There must be 150 different kinds of shampoo. And of course, the Marxian, would, like him, would say, there can't be more than one best kind of shampoo. Why don't you just have the best kind of shampoo and put it on the shelf? And to hell with the 149 other varieties of shampoo uh, that you're selling. So he saw all that as really a frivolous exploitation of what he called artificial manufactured desires. And that would become unnecessary. So this new and higher, what he called positive liberty, would translate into a lot more time to do the things we deeply prefer uh, instead of what the commercial system to which we are enslaved requires of us. Now, euphoric theorists, even today praise this Marxist democratic outcome as a time when the self-educated masses will enjoy mostly leisure or the right not to work. And they will spend a lot of time vacationing in California and other places like that and studying things that they love uh, instead of working. One recent enthusiast gushes that under positive liberty, quote, one could devote a lifetime to the study of mathematics or chess or of centipedes, unquote. Scarcity could be overcome through the, quote, democratic management of society. Can, can you imagine? <laughs> We're having enough trouble managing it when it's not democratic. And goods and services would be allocated strictly according to need. Who decides who needs what? He doesn't say. But if you smell a dictator in the works, you're getting pretty close. Marx even imagined that checkout stands in grocery stores and other types of stores would disappear because unselfish citizens, 
You see, what he's getting at is the renovation of the human spirit from the ground up. Unselfish citizens would just walk in and take what they needed from the shelves and would never take any more. So what some economists call the tragedy of the commons would not be operating. You know, the tragedy of the commons, there's some famous essays written about that, is where people in the village have a common pastures for their animals, for example, and the people with most anim more animals put them out. They don't ration the whole thing, and they end up eating it all and leaving none for the next guy. So that's called the tragedy of the commons because people, in, in effect, do think of themselves first. And this probably happens to be more true in private uh, free societies than in these uh, euphoric uh, uh, situations, uh, at least when they start. I know that I know a little bit about the kibbutz in, in your country, how that's changed a lot since it started. It probably started out in the spirit in the Marxian sort of spirit of a one for all and all for one and all that. But it quickly mutated. Well, not quickly, slowly, actually. Uh, machinery or f for moderns, computers, robots and so on, would supply most basic needs and moral suasion would supply the motive for everyone to do whatever, his words, socially useful work was required by society each year. So he was only interested in socially useful work. Uh, everything else he considered frivolous. But in such a democracy, the radical emancipation and self-realization of each individual and therefore of the whole community would be the highest objective. You see, so that goes back to my little few words I, I, I used earlier about the romantic spirit, which was about the lamp. The individual is a lamp of meaning, generating meaning and projecting it onto the world around him, not mirroring the meanings that were already established in the world, meaning, you know, the meanings of others and so on. So Marx was kind of in that romantic vein, see, and affected by it, as everyone was in his time and as everyone is today. I think we live in a neo-romantic period right now. All the systems of valuation of the arts and movies and everything else that we do is on how original it is. Is it original? Boy, this is something new and all that. A very few people in their artistic lives or aesthetic lives are actually trying to recreate uh, the beauties of the past. Marx referred to this form of democracy, his words, as the resolved mystery of all constitutions, unquote. That's a big mouthful. <laughs> uh, because he believed that only a constitution that arises from the will of all free people is legitimate and that it ought to be remade whenever necessary as what he called the free product of men. Quote, unquote. At this ideal point of max maximum democratization and universal suffrage, Marx dreamed that political society would be absorbed into civil life in a transparent unity of will. And for him, quote, this human emancipation through the unity of civil and political life consummated the realization of democracy, right? The human emancipation through the unity of civil and political life. So no longer do you have the state and political society and beneath that free civil society, they get merged into one. And that's why in all the modern examples of this in the less uh, states uh, that we know of that are less communistic, but are heading that way, it looks like, like Sweden, Canada and the USA, uh, so-called liberal democracy is has been going in this direction, kind of fusing uh, the private civil life with political life, mostly by taking over its functions and uh, substituting uh, through a process I call substitute care. You know, uh, in my province of Ontario in Canada, uh, sport used to be uh, something that was organized by individuals who were interested in it. I'm not talking about the schools and all that kind of stuff. And maybe some municipalities had some sporting events. At least they were looking after the soccer fields, cutting the grass, looking after the hockey arenas and so on. But the actual organizations, you know, the hockey clubs, the soccer clubs, 
<laughs> field hockey clubs, whatever they were, they were organized by interested individuals, parents and their children and their friends who just happened to love the sport. The government had nothing to do with it. But now uh, what's called Sport Ontario, which is a large organization in my province, almost every sport you can imagine has a little office down in the city of Toronto with some one or two or three bureaucrats sitting in them who are organizing all this stuff for the people who enjoy the sports. So it's not that you can you can go out now and organize your own baseball or hockey tournament. You need a sanction. And the sanction comes from government approval of how you're doing it and all that sort of thing. But this is one of the ways, very subtle, maybe not so subtle ways, in which the state takes over uh, the exercise of private life as it used to be enjoyed. Uh, so it's insidious and you have to watch out for it. And every time I have a chance, I turn to people who tell me that uh, the government controls their sport. For example, my wife is a super squash player. She was Canadian Masters champion a couple of times in a row. And uh, it's run by Squash Ontario. And, and I said to her, why don't you people do it? Pardon? I said, why don't you organize it yourself? Take it over. Tell the government <laughs> to go to hell, basically, and that you will organize the turn tournaments and so on and, and get get them out of it. Why would you want the government controlling your sporting life? Well, she thought that was a good idea, but that it was too, too much work uh, to pull that off. So the government is still running it. Anyway, once it goes in that direction, you know, it's just really hard to push it back because... People don't mind someone else doing something difficult for them. Uh, the recreation department in my little town, which is called King City, we don't have a king here, but it's called King City. My little, recre little recreation department in this small town used to have, uh, you know, like one or two employees uh, looking after recreation and, you know, like I said, keeping the fields cut and making sure that people had some facilities to play their sports on. And now they got five or six employees who are running all these organizations. Like it's been just subtly moved over and abandoned from the point of view of free citizens. At any rate, the state would in effect be replaced, for Marx, would be replaced by society. See, he's, he's doing it the other way around. He's saying the state would in effect be replaced by civil society. Private property by communal property and egotism by selflessness. He doesn't tell you who's going to run all this, but that's the process he sees in operation. Representatives, once given the civil trust, would obey mandates, but those mandates would come from people who had always deliberated first and were always careful to vote for the good of all. I will argue at the end of this book that under modern hyper-democracy, as I call it, we are now realizing Marx's worst fear because rather than the state dissolving into society, our societies are being dissolved into the state. The question, who is to decide what is for the good of all, was the doorway through which walked later vanguard theorists such as Lenin, <clears throat> for whom communism was the perfect fulfillment of democracy. He argued that the unconscious proletariat, who preferred vodka to voting, <laughs> must be led to the good by more aware elites. It was this importation of the techniques of substitute judgment and the means and override, as I called it in our last talk, that quickly spelled the end of Marx's naively beautiful theory of democracy. These techniques were made necessary by the naivete itself. That is by the disparity between Marx's theory of spontaneous natural goodness and the reality of the ignorance and apathy of the people, or what I call the, of their will to obey. <laughs> and I've talked about that before, that we have a, we have a will to obey, <laughs> as, a, as well as a will uh, to control and a will to be free. And probably the strongest of those three wills is the will to obey in the human psyche. Collective freedom and democracy, said his revisionist followers, would never come from within. It would have to be imposed from without until the dumb got smart. This conclusion led to vanguard theory, just as certainly as it had in the French Revolution, at the moment when Robespierre, the great believer in the goodness and wisdom of the people, finally decided that he had been wrong, 
and the ignorant had to be forced to be free or be killed. Today, Western universities are home to thousands of Western Marxist scholars who have never lived under Marxist rule and who believe that there's no connection be between Marx's pure ideas and, uh, and what communism became. Very few of them realize that the communist idea of freedom presupposed the total abol abolition of civil society and of the market economy by subjecting social forces to conscious, rational control in a totally planned economic and social system. Nor do they see that the totalitarian form of Marxism came into being only because of the conscious stri uh, strenuous striving on the part of the communist states to realize the Marxist conception of freedom and of the true self. You can see again this thrust towards, you know, the, the true community, the true self, or the true me. <laughs> this true self was for Marx nothing less and nothing more than what he called man's species essence, quote unquote, a species essence. What this gobbledygook means is that if you strip away all human egotism, and particular will, you end up with what is common to the species. And this is said to be the only true and sacred self. This had to be the goal of society. And the gulag was as essential to it in the Soviet Union as the guillotine had been in France. It would be difficult to imagine a notion of the self more opposed than this to our currently fashionable romantic ideal of the self as unique and particular and even sacred. Remember the phrase, my body, my choice, and all that kind of thing, which is repeated endlessly today in the Western democracies. You know, choice is the mantra above all other mantras about my choice. And that is, is taken to authenticate any human action. What is so striking is how both visions are utterly at odds with the standard Christian view of the self from which they both have sprung. Namely, that while it is true we are unique and ought not to be dissolved into a mystical general will, that uniqueness is badly flawed and must be transformed by salvation. Salvation in Marxism is strictly secular. A history provides no good exam as history provides no good examples, it remains unclear how Marx landed on such an otherworldly idealistic notion of democracy. One suggestion is that it was imbibed with the general education provided by European society at the time. The small democratic city states of Greece were considered by many to have been the ideal polity, and one theory which we run across is that Marx yearned for a return to that form. But the theory does not fit. For one thing, after the debacle of the French Revolution, all of Europe, America, and Canada were fed up with democracy unhinged and were well aware that the Athenian form, above all others, had led to social chaos and tyranny itself. Furthermore, the Greek idea of freedom was not at all up to Marx's modern egalitarian Christian charity ideal. Indeed, as we saw in chapter one of this book, the Greeks would have scorned our egalitarianism as ridiculous. They didn't mind treating all generals the same, or all peons and peasants the same, or all women the same, but they were not ever talking about treating everybody the same as everybody else. A more likely theory is that he was creating a powerful and prophetic secular myth of freedom straight from his own Jewish and Christian roots. And this next section is called Marx, the Mystical Millenarian. And it would be helped if everybody listening had, had read the first part of this book, but I'll, I'll try to make sure it's understandable. In the greatest and most profound prophetic tradition of the West, Marx saw himself as a secular messiah announcing the coming social and political transformation of this earthly realm into something he called, his phrase, a kingdom of freedom, quote unquote, created for the ultimate liberation 
of the human species. Not of the individual necessarily, but of the whole human species. But he was a materialist who did not believe in spiritual forces. So there would be no moral ap apocalypse or a judgment day from above, but rather a complete social transformation from within, according to the dialectical laws of history, which he had simply materialized, having borrowed them from Hegel. He was not a doom, what I call a doomsday millenarian, uh, well, to use my own term, but a mystical one for whom this transformation was already at work in human history, just as Christ was already at work in human history for Joachim of Flora, whom we we met earlier in our talk on Gnosticism, and for all the mystical millenarians of our civilization. For Marx, active history replaced providence as the arbiter of human destiny, and it and it once and for all would free man from his primitive slavery to what he called an alien power. That is, it sounds like the devil, but that is from all forms of inner and outer slavery and antagonism, especially from what he called, quote, blind market forces, unquote. He believed that free men should always control things and be superior to them, never their slaves. And so he hated the idea that industrial man had enslaved himself, not only to actual things, but but more terribly to the oppressive forces of supply and demand that arise from the production of those things. The very classical liberalism we once respected so highly, he considered a crass and immoral system perpetuating economic forces that produce privileges for some, but misery and unfreedom or slavery for most, even for the owners and the bosses who were enslaved to the system and couldn't escape it because they couldn't change it and they liked what it produced for them. That's like somebody who owned slaves in the uh, South of America uh, during the Civil War, uh, often argued that slavery was just as enslaving of the black slave as it was of his owner who couldn't get, uh, get out of slavery if he tried because the whole system was was geared that way. And I remember, I think it was Jefferson who characterized slavery as a the slavery system as a wolf. And he said, in a remarkable phrase, he said, we have the wolf by the ears and we cannot let him go. You can see the power of that metaphor. You have the wolf by the ears and if you let him go, he's going to bite you and devour you. So you have to keep holding on. And he felt that was the condition of a lot of the slave owners who were already in the system and couldn't get out of it. And that's what Marx is arguing about to some extent with the Marx, with the uh, capitalist system. By the way, I've said before, and I just, I've used it myself, but now I don't. I don't like the word capital. It's a slur term of the left uh, to, to knock uh, the freedom of Western societies, uh, the real engine of, of the success of the Western societies, at least in material terms, uh, because I think we have a lot of failings in moral terms, but in material, in material and scientific terms and all that, uh, the West is pretty amazing. Uh, so um, uh, the real engine of that success is free enterprise. And both words are important. It's, it's an engine because it's free and because it's enterprising, not just because it generates capital. Because all entities, all economic entities on earth generate capital, especially governments who deploy more capital than anybody else. Uh, for example, in Canada, I think it's well known here that the government of Canada has, has the largest advertising and marketing budget in the entire country. And it's a government agency, not a, not a so-called capitalist entity, the government itself. So you better believe they're spending a lot of what they call capital on the um, on their advertising. At any rate, um, that is why Marx urged that individual freedom for self be renounced in favor of freedom for all under a collective will to be represented by, guess who? By the Communist Party. He was passionate about the freedom of the species, not of the individual. Bourgeois liberal freedom only creates a society of alienated 
and autonomous individuals exchanging things with each other, with, with each other for money while locked in an endless collision of conflicting values. Well, I have to say, I haven't got much time for Marx, and I think his main theories were very flawed. But I, I, I do agree that what we see around us is a lot of wars of conflicting values going on in our society, and I don't think it's going to end anytime soon. Only when each economically emancipated and fully developed individual is finally expressing the underlying species essence in every thought and behavior can we be considered free. Now, those are scary words, in every thought and behavior. And what's going on in the West right now? Not so much this Marxist stuff, really, at least not as openly, but we have all these thought, con thought control and speech control devices and hate tribunals and things like that. <laughs> the other day I said to a friend, you know, who, I don't know, he said something about uh, hate speech. And I said, well, it's, hate is never a nice emotion, but why should it be a crime? And how, how can you control it anyway? The only big problem with it is it, of it is when people try to do some, something hateful. <laughs> you can't control what people think about other people or other countries or their actions. But that's what we're trying to do. And we're sniffing it out everywhere. And I think the worst thing that could happen to you in Canada today would be to be dragged before one of these so-called human rights tribunals and uh, charged with hate speech when all you were really doing was expressing your honest opinion about something with not a, not a smidgen of hateful feeling attached to it. You were just expressing something honestly. I think we've departed from that kind of freedom. And that's why everybody has gone so silent. The dinner, around the dinner table in Canada, whether it's your family or with friends, unless they're awfully close friends, you do not dare to speak your mind because uh, there's eggshells that have been scattered all around you by the powers that be. And you don't want to hear that crackling sound when you step on them. Uh, I have a dear, dear, very close friend who, who tells me that I'm his best friend and I tell him the same. And I said, why do you think? And he said, because around you, he said, I'm unafraid. I can say anything I want to say without fear of censure. And, and that, that is now the baseline uh, standard for a true friendship. Well, in, in addition to the fellow feeling and the love and all that, is being unafraid. Well, what kind of society we, do we have, really? Uh, we're so far down the road that the highest standard of liberty that we have is to be unafraid around other people. Not long ago, we were unafraid around anybody. I can remember when I was a younger man, there was a Scottish lady across living across the street. She weighed about 90 pounds. And I remember watching her one time, dressing down a 250-pound man in the neighborhood who'd done something really stupid. And she was like, don't you dare talk to me like that, and all that kind of thing. And he was just shivering in his boots. But you better believe she was going to speak her mind freely. Now, it's very different, and it makes me very sad. Um, okay, so other outside powers were ignorance and class oppression. It is the later influence, evil and satanic, satanic, that alienates the working and landless poor from themselves by forcing them to sell their labor to capitalists. The laws of capitalism, Marx considered to operate like the power of fate for the ancients. Playing on the myth of salvation and deliverance, Marx, uh, uh, Marx's fantasy of good and evil features a proletarian chosen people with what he called world historical redemptive significance who will eventually lead humanity to collective freedom. Workers are predestined for this role because they are the first and only class already fully alienated as slaves of capital from an authentic human existence. Hence, after the advent of universal democratic suffrage, they will be the first to take over all means of production and emancipate humanity from material bondage. You can see how this ties into the Gnostic view of an evil world, too. The contemptus mundi phrase in Latin, you know, a, 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 a terrible world grabs us and makes us slave to material things. 
frankly, this was a completely screwball idea that could only have been produced by an intellectual who'd never met a payroll or put up his home and personal guarantees as security on a serious loan. Had he done so, he would have instantly realized that what, and by the way, Marx was just forever borrowing money from his friend and especially from his close friend, Frederick Engels, who basically supported him when he was writing most of his book, Das Kapital. But had he done so, he would have instantly realized that what the workers of the world run from faster than anything is financial risk, because what he called ownership of the means of production, quote unquote, if it is to have any meaning at all, will always <clears throat> imply the risk of losing everything you own. Not one to let a brute fact interfere with a utopian, utopian ideal, however, and much like the Gnostics before him, who thought evil lay in material things themselves, Marx slipped into a belief that evil lies in the material process that produces those things. So for him, the world congealed into two opposing forces, the masters of the industrial army of the bourgeois capitalist system, what a mouthful, and the enslaved proletariat. He believed that history had brought both into a last final battle between good and evil, and that the working class would change the whole course of history, quote, when the class struggle reaches the decisive hour, unquote. <laughs> Watch out for it. Uh, maybe that's why um, uh, Khrushchev shook his head when he came to America. He was in Los Angeles, I think, and he went by a building site. Some they, they were building a building or a house or whatever, and he saw all these cars along the road. And he turned to someone and he said, who do those cars belong to? And the Americans said, well, to the workmen, of course. And he started to laugh. What are you laughing at? He said, well, in Russia, he said, there's no workman who owns a car and so on. And he really got a shock when the it was the Labor Union of America which protested his visit before anybody else. And I think he went home with his tail between his legs. But just as with Rousseau, um, Marx's work is larded with the language and the symbol of sudden change, of transformation, of revelation, and of inst instantaneous redemption by which the workers, he put it this way, raise themselves to their universal mission of directing all mankind to a realm of freedom in a supreme society of communist character, a kingdom of God, not his words, mine, a kingdom of God without God and on earth, which is the ultimate goal and the ideal of Marx's historical messianism. Now, Marx made much of the idea that the secret society of the secret history of society was to be found not in what society says about itself, that is, in how it explains or justifies itself, which is only a form of self flattery, but rather in the deeper forces underlying the economic and class conditions that generate its real history. As Carl Lewis, Carl Lewis was a fabulous thinker and writer and one of what one author called Heidegger's children, not his real children, but his intellectual children. He astutely maintained that the secret history of Marx's own formula is not at all economic or historical, as he liked to argue, but theological. It is not, quote, conscious materialism and Marx's own opinion of it, but the religious spirit of prophetism, unquote. Wow. In other words, and by the way, that comes from a book by Carl Loeth, which I recommend to everybody. It's a short book, wonderful book, called Meaning in History. And what a read it is. But in other words, Marx's own secret message was not the literal historical or materialist one that he blabbered so much about. Rather, it was a democratic millenarian prophecy of world salvation. And it is this that must be interpreted for its symbolic and spiritual meaning. The international communism that Marx spawned <clears throat> may thus be understood as a kind of uh, intellectual superstructure concealing a mystical millenarian movement in the guise of democracy as collective freedom. The subtext, as they say, of his elaborate myth 
was the ancient and enduring complaint of slavery, both slavery to oneself and to an oppressive society, combined with the general Gnostic complaint of material evil and injustice. If the world is bad, it is because there's no good God. So let's change it ourselves. For Marx, the armies of light, that is to say the workers or the proletariat, are trapped as slaves in their condition. And hence they are poised against the enslavers, the armies of darkness or the middle class or the bourgeoisie, and they are doing battle in a last judgment of history. This is the saints against Satan. His closest buddy, Frederick Engels, referred often to the forces of capitalism, his words, as the master demons, quote unquote, of civilization. How revealing is that? But the real driving force behind Marx's vision was not history or Hegel, as he imagined, but the trans, I'm quoting Loeth now, the transparent messianism, which has its unconscious root in Marx's own being and even in his race, unquote. That is, in his Jewish insistence on absolute righteousness. And this was so, uh, even though Marx was anti-religious, and some writer would say even anti-Semitic. It is therefore not by chance, as Lewis put it, now we got to concentrate on what Lewis said. It's pretty compressed. He said the last antagonism between the two hostile camps of bourgeoisie <coughs> and proletariat corresponds to the Jewish Christian belief in a final fight between Christ and Antichrist in the last epoch of history that the task of the proletariat corresponds to the world historical mission of the chosen people and that the redemptive and universal uh, function of the most degraded class is conceived on the religious pattern of cross and resurrection, that the ultimate transformation of the realm of necessity into a realm of democratic freedom corresponds to the transformation of what Loeth calls in Latin the civitas terrena, or the city of the world, into a civitas dei, or a city of God. Those were Augustine's terms. And that the whole process of history, as outlined in the Communist Manifesto, corresponds to the general scheme of the Jewish Christian interpretation of history as a providential advance towards a final goal, which is meaningful. That's the end of Lois' quotation. And now that's a mouthful too, but it bears reading many times over. And the power of such an analysis springs from the understanding that the mere facts of history and social life have never ever been remotely sufficient to inspire millions of people the world over to sing this song. Rather, this is a very, very old song of religious deliverance recast in secular terms. But it was, and it remains, a song that succeeded by intentionally omitting the very elements that make a religion religious, namely a personal humbling and suffering, a consciousness of one's imperfections, and a seeking of forgiveness, forgiveness and salvation. All of which to, is to say that Marxism was a secular theology of democratic freedom that thrived by substituting a romanticized goodness of man for the goodness of God, and thus was able to bypass completely both the everyday need for moral self-judgment and the political need for strictly limited government. On the contrary, it was precisely the enormous flattery and appeal of an essentially Gnostic image of man combined with limitless state power that so rocked Western civilization in the 20th century and led to incalculable human suffering justified by the universals of what? Of totalitarian democracy. In essence, Marx's Promethean revolt was against the substance of an Orthodox Christian civilization that had in fact lost its God. But he used as his vehicle of attack the structure of that very same religion, now secularized, in which man replaced God. Now, here's the key sentence of this whole session, it seems to me. 
In other words, Marx aped in form the very substance that he mocked. I'll say it again. He aped in form the very substance he mocked. And that is why I say the 20th century became a slaughterhouse of history uh, because of the clash between two manifestations of Christianity, one half living and the other half dead. On the ideological battlefield, a dispirited Western civilization in retreat was facing a new and vigorous secular millenarian crusade on the attack. In contrast to the old bedrock belief of Western man that creation is a good and ordered realm, Marx specifically denied that man is rooted in an existing moral order of goodness and creation. Man depends strictly on the scientific laws of ec economics and history as Marx read them. Remarking on this history, he said, quote, we do not see in it a revelation of God, but only of man, unquote. The substance of his message was radically Gnostic. We are trapped in an alien material world, but the form of his solution was radically millenarian. Marx believed that man himself could bring about on earth what God had promised but failed to deliver. And that's my little take on Marxism. And um, thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, William. Uh, can can you name a few of those millenarians' uh, biggest names? The those who are orchestrating <clears throat> this kind of um, movement and change well, in the affection of society. Well, I guess you'd have to go back to Joaquim Flora, whom I mentioned in one of our previous lectures. <clears throat> he was the one who proposed the uh, three-part structure uh, to the West, which was basically taken on board by a lot of uh, thinkers after him. Uh, this idea that the first stage was the stage of the father and of the law. And I think he equated Judaism with that, you know, more law than anything. And then the sec second stage... Um, was the stage of, of religion, and uh, the third stage was the stage of Christ. Uh, excuse me, the second stage was the coming of Christ, and, um, and the third stage uh, was the stage he was most looking forward to, and which he predicted, which is the stage of the spirit, uh, the universal spirit, and um, but the long and short of it is that all millenarian thinkers in the theological sense are either believe that the millennium is is here already because, you know, Christ is here. And if you don't believe in him, well, you're not part of it <laughs> and so on. But other millenarians say, no, no, it's yet to come. It's yet to come. And they're even forecasting dates for the end of the world and the perfect kingdom of God will suddenly transpire and so on. Uh, so I think most uh, millenarians are of that belief. Some of them are even weird. They're what I call doomsday millenarians, that at the end of the millennium, there's going to be the judgment and uh, the evil will be cast into hell and the good will be saved and all that kind of thing. But in the rough spe uh, sense in which I'm using the term millenarian, it's about people who are... Um, not theological, but who, have, who are secular, but who have basically transposed the hope for the perfect kingdom of God into worldly terms. And the idea is they're disappointed, they're angry, they're upset that it's not here. So we're going to have to do it ourselves. And I think this is what is has powered uh, so many of these movements in, in modern times. Uh, you see, and I think that Marxism and and Nazism and um, and Mussolini's um, fascism were all millenarian movements promising the kingdom of heaven on earth, uh, which they were going to bring about without God. You see, but it's what I call this expectationalism, which drove it all. Now, suppose that expectationalism wasn't there. Suppose they were all raised not as post-Christians, but as um, Hindus, you know, for whom um, the recycling of life uh, and Tibetans for whom, you know, you're going to come back as some other form of life. 
Uh, but but there is no there is no millennium. You know, God is you know the great one. God is ruling over everything, and uh, you can't influence it even if you try. So there's a certain fatalism, which leads to a certain passivism, which was why these revolutionary movements don't tend to come out of those kinds of societies. Now this is odd because why is it? I've often asked uh, scholars that I know, why is it that uh, in China, for example, people whose religion was basically uh, Confucianism or some other ancient Chinese religion, why did they graft themselves onto the work of a of a Jewish German uh, intellectual who was forecasting, predicting the kingdom of heaven on earth when they had been living for thousands of years without that expectation? Well, I think that was that came about because they were retrained. They were trained, uh, actually given, got into great trouble for professing ancient Chinese religions, any kind of religion. And look at today at um, uh, look at today at the uh, movement in in uh, China to persecute followers of uh, Falun Dafa, uh, which is this meditative exercise. I happen to know some people involved in this. <laughs> I don't follow it myself, but um, they were behind the creation of the Epoch Times newspaper, um, the motto of which is truth and tradition. What a great motto. <laughs> and anyway, they're based in New York, and they were created by a Chinese-American whose buddies were basically arrested or threatened, whatever, by Chinese officials when they went over there for something or other, because they decided to go to the park one day and sign up for this uh, Falun Gong or Falun Dafa, it's called sometimes, group, which is strictly a group that practices meditative exercises. You can see them in the park sometime doing their woo-woo stuff with their hands and their legs and meditating and, and so on. Uh, and what really is, uh, frightened the hell out of the Chinese uh, officials was because they put up with it at first. They figured it'll pass. But this thing grew and grew. And they realized that when it got to 100 million, get this, 100 million people had signed up for the Falun Gong meditation groups. Um, and in doing so, they were ripping up their Communist Party cards. So the party started coming down hard on practitioners of this spiritual movement, uh, see? And that's because they had already done that many years, many decades in advance, almost a century in advance. They had purged China. I mean, I mean Mao Zedong had basically purged China of its religious and theological base. And I think that's what opened it to the secular millenarian uh, thinking, which uh, became part of all communist movements uh, uh, since then. I had a friend uh, at Stanford um, who had a photographic memory, a uh, real photographic memory, and his family had a beautiful library with like two or 3,000 fabulous old Chinese books in it. And when the Red Army came into town, when it was going to come into town, they knew they, they, they would destroy their library. So they asked this fellow, this young man, to memorize all the books in the library, which he did. He set about reading them all. And when the revolution went by and on to the next whatever, he sat down and reproduced them, which must have been pretty, pretty difficult. But um, you can see that, you know, the so-called um, cultural revolution was about the destruction of the theological basis of Chinese society and its replacement with a materialistic basis, which I've just explained, hopefully successfully, uh, in, in fact, was a disguise for a different kind of millenarian uh, theological movement. Thank and you these, very these, much. And, and, and it these, was and very and successful, and the your explanation, you. I mean. Thank you. And these two forms did battle in Europe in the Second World War. See, two different notions of democracy were at work, although no one in my country, no one in the Canadian or American army or whatever was going to refer to Marxism or communism as democratic. Uh, you would have been got a very funny look. <laughs> but if you dig down to the underlying theory, uh, this is what this is what you see. Um, I have a question by one of the members, uh, Amy. Uh, she's uh, asking about techno technocracy and uh, she's mentioning a, a, res a researcher called Patrick Wood. Would you would you connect uh, this uh, move into technocracy as the next step of the millenariums? 
And what is your opinion in general about uh, this danger? Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understood uh, uh, what you were saying. Te- te- techno, um, technocracy, it's like uh, the technocracy. Technocracy, yeah. Yes, I apologize. So um, no, no, is no. that like the next steps of millenariums? Millenarians? Oh, I think it's already here. Um, that's why we have uh, people sending spaceships to the moon and to Mars and all that sort of thing. Uh, the illusion that people have is that these um, technological advances are an improvement of mankind. It's never really been demonstrated. You know, you could say that the 20th century was the most technologically advanced century in the history of mankind, but it was also what I called the slaughterhouse of history. See, so technoc- you can't say that technocracy and peace and goodness uh, go together. It's probably uh, looks looks like it's just the opposite. Now, you're you're familiar with Professor Rummel's book on democide. Yes. It's a terrible read, but I think he's very good at gathering all the facts. Uh, he updated it. Did you did you know? He, he updated the numbers and it's 262 millions now who died oh, by yes. government. Oh, okay. Well, I have to go look for that. I have the original edition. But when you ask somebody, how many people... Do you think uh, died in the 20th century as combatants in wars, people in uniform and so on, people who are mar- part of military organizations? And they always get it wrong. So you tell them, well, it was around 50 million on all sides. But then I say, how many people do you think were killed by their own governments in the 20th century? And when you tell them it's something like, you know, two or 300 million people, they can't believe it. So then no, I have to say, can't. well, you better go read uh, Rommel's book to get the background, the history in the background, yeah? Yeah. He is a professor from the University of Hawaii, right? Um, yes. And the book is Democide. Yes, and the um, underlying message of that book is government is bad for your health. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no kidding. Yeah. Um, let me see if we have any other questions, and if not, we are going to wrap it up. Guys, any questions for William? Uh, <laughs> it's a quiet bunch. Um, so what is going to be the topic uh, next week? Well, uh, I want to talk about Hitler's uh, Nazism, uh, which has some interesting twists in it. Uh, the underlying uh, thesis is not so different from the analysis of Marxism, but it is different. And I think you'll find it interesting. I'm looking forward. And uh, thank you as usual. And I will see you next Wednesday uh, on 2 p.m. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. You, you said, I will you send you an email with a link uh, to this uh, recording so you can publish it on your YouTube channel. And thank, thank you, you very, very much, much, William. See you <laughs> next, See you next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.